let's get started. So I'm also sharing my screen. I want to make sure you can see it. So right now you should see the Dutch test treatment guide. So if you can give me a thumbs up that you see the treatment guide, that would be good. Um, and let me just sort of tell you, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm still letting people in. Um, let me just tell you what I'm gonna do today. Um, I'm gonna basically walk you through this treatment booklet. I emailed it to everyone, but otherwise I'll, I'll show you how to just get it online and everyone who, um, you can actually just get it easily online, but everyone as a practitioner also with Dutch has access to many other trainings. So I'll tell you how to get those um, also. Um, and then I'm gonna walk you through the test and sort of show you on the screen side to side um, because there's so many layers to this information and you don't need to remember it all. You just need to know um, how to find it. Um, as people are still coming in, this is the treatment booklet. We're gonna spend plenty of time there. Um, but I also wanted to show you a couple other resources. I didn't email these to you because I don't use them myself much, but if you use these supplements, they can be helpful. So I don't really use Metagenics, but if you use Metagenics, they have a treatment guide that is specific um, to the Dutch test. So can everyone see that? I just wanna make sure as I flip from page to page, you're um, still seeing it. So let me know uh, if not. Uh, okay, good. Um, so that gives you an idea of what's there and you can see, you can scroll down. Um, this will make more sense as we go over the test. But if someone used this brand of supplements, there it is very specific um, with the names to it. Still letting people in. Um, all right, and then if you use orthomolecular products, again, I don't use much of them. I'll tell you um, some of what I use, uh, but if you like that line and use it often, then here again is a guide where they've taken their specific supplements and related it to the Dutch, um, uh, the Dutch treatment guide that we're gonna go over. And then I have some sample tests. Let's get to the top. Um, I have some sample tests that I'll show you. Um, I happen to grab all women for this. Uh, you can do this testing for men also. I did grab one teen, that was sort of an interesting case. So I have a couple test examples to show you. Um, for those that I did email it, um, I also included a little gift. So if you got this, um, that was from me. The reason I included the gift, just so you know, and people opt in and get it, but I just emailed it to you so you don't have to opt in. Um, but this had about, to, about communicating. And the reason um, I brought it up is some of the people who were um, messaging me, uh, in fact, one local doctor in particular, I was thinking of um, an MD who's newer to functional medicine was asking questions about how to communicate this information to patients. So if that's something you're curious about, we can talk about it more at the end. But anyway, I just, I'm biased because I created this system. It was published by McGraw-Hill out of New York, but I gave you the shorthand guide. So it was just a gift to be able to communicate. And this is the part that's gold, which is who are your patients? And when they get grumpy, how do they respond? What do they need to hear to listen? So anyway, that's in there. Okay, I think I've let enough people in. I'm gonna start um, very briefly about myself. I am Dr. Brandy Zachary. Um, most people call me Dr. Zachary or Doc. We have another Brandy on our team, so it helps to keep us separate. Um, and I do functional medicine. My license is as a DC, doctor of chiropractic. I had that career for a while. I had an injury, did a completely different career. Um, and then I got sick like really, really sick. So people who know my story, I was declared permanently disabled. I was in the hospital every three weeks getting IVIG uh, treatment. I was diagnosed with a primary immunodeficiency disorder and a host of other stuff. I won't tell you the whole long story, but, um, but it was a nightmare. And that's how I found functional medicine. And so functional medicine was how I, you know, got life back enough to be able to start a clinic and, um, you know, have fun. So, uh, so that's all been 
Very good. So I do um, functional medicine with a lot of my patients and clients um, throughout the U.S. and on a couple other continents now also. All right. Um, I would say my specialty is gut health, but obviously in functional medicine, you're dealing with the person as a whole. So we do, you know, we serve a whole range of um, conditions and issues. Um, I don't prescribe. That's not my license. So I will talk about some of the natural things, um, but I'll also talk about using supplemental versions of bioidenticals. I have colleagues that I'll co-manage or refer with um, that use prescriptions. So there's you know a whole spectrum of things that you can do for people when dealing with hormones. Okay, I'm gonna go through the treatment guide first. Um, they don't list in the same order as the test. So when I show you both side by side, I'm gonna do it in a different order, but I just wanna orient you to it. And part of what led to this class is in our IFM group. I've done all the IFM courses that are wonderful, um, but in our IFM group, um, some people were saying, you know, the test looks a little overwhelming. It looks a little daunting. How do you interpret it? So I'm sharing from a practitioner level, just what I do. Um, with patients. I don't work for the lab company that makes Dutch. I'm not affiliated with them at all. Um, they do have great training. So, and most of it's free. So you can get even more in depth. Okay. So here's the PDF. This is what I emailed everyone. It answers some basic questions. So just know that that resource is there. Little table of contents. Um, it goes through cortisol first, which is not the same order as the lab. So that's why we're going to reverse it when we, when we jump into the actual lab uh, reports. Um, but this is helpful because some of the low cortisol symptoms and high cortisol symptoms, um, these are the kinds of things that are speaking a bit more to the patient. So when you are communicating things, not getting too lost in um, some of the metabolites, which if you really dive deep into this and it interests you, it's, it's fascinating. But of course, the patient's more interested in like low sex drive and they can't sleep or they have a cortisol belly or they're starting to get hot flashes and sweats. You know, that's their language. So this page is nice for that language um, and sort of just noticing um, one of the things they put here is so if someone has low cortisol, um, you know, feeling tired, low energy, low motivation, that can be one of the symptoms. But then on the right hand side, what else could be one of the symptoms? And so they're giving you some other things to make sure you consider or rule out, right? Um, but sometimes also, if you're writing out little chart notes for patients, I know for our office, or at least my part of our office, um, I went from in person to virtual this year and um, switched. Um, let me see if I am trying to zoom in here for you. Oh, more people let in. Um, hang on, it's not letting me zoom that one. Anyway, I switched to online. Here we go. Um, is that good enough or do you need to get zoomed in more? Let me know. Uh, I'll keep an eye on that chat box. Um, so anyway, going online and uh, working with people remotely, I'm typing a lot more and putting things into notes. So uh, it's nice to be able to copy and paste something. All right, so hopefully that's more clear. Tell me if it still looks too small. Um, all right, so this page um, just sort of gives you, like some of you know Dr. Selle's model of the different phases of, um, you know, adrenal exhaustion and whatnot. So this relates to that, those adaptive phases, uh, low cortisol, high cortisol, um, talks a little bit about the actual disease states, which you will sometimes catch with the Dutch test, but um, as you know, doesn't happen that often. Most of the time we get, you know, subclinical changes. Um, the next page is just again, sort of summarizing low cortisol versus high and low DHEA versus Hi, this will make more sense when we look at the lab. Um, some potential treatment considerations, we'll go through this more, but good information where you sort of just match up what's going on with your patient. And it's, 
you know, it's not a prescription, like do exactly this, but it's giving you some ideas of what to consider. Um, say now we're getting into sex hormones, progesterone, estrogen, same type of thing. What are the symptoms of low uh, progesterone and estrogen, high estrogen? So that can be helpful um, and start talking the patient's language, right? Acne, um, mood issues, breast tenderness. Um, I was reading from high estrogen there. Um, a little bit more about how they assess, make their assessments, which is good to learn. It is fascinating. I'm not going to spend time on that. You can read it yourself. Um, some of the root causes behind why it would be high or low. So this is another good thing once you see the lab report is to go back and see if you're missing something. Um, and then this is the chart you're really going to love. So this is what I was trying to skip ahead to. Um, so you can match up the progesterone value on the left with the estrogen value across the top and sort of go like if someone's estrogen uh, was within range um, and then their progesterone was sort of below the luteal phase, you know, what are some things that you have to consider? So we'll definitely use this as we go through the labs. And then this is for, um, you know, childbearing years, premenopausal, um, here's the postmenopausal ranges, so difference. Um, and then this is very helpful, especially for those of you that do prescribe and for those of us who don't, um, if you're using um, DHEA or you're using um, supplemental bioidenticals, these um, values are very helpful. So this is page 13 of it. And they actually have additional training on how to monitor if you, um, like I'm not a big fan of testosterone pellets, but if you use testosterone pellets in your clinic um, or you're prescribing oral progesterone or something like that, they have specific videos to help you monitor it along the way. Oops, there were more to admit. Um, for those that are just joining us, we just started by doing a very brief walk through the treatment guide. So you haven't really missed anything, you're good. We're just getting ramped up here. Um, okay, so we'll talk a bit more about that dosing. Um, testosterone for women, uh, and then it's going to get into men. Uh, here's testosterone levels still. You've got your grid, right? Um, and then testosterone for men, and I think that's about the end of it. Um, again, a hormone replacement therapy guide for men. Um, okay, and a little bit more about monitoring, using the Dutch to um, monitor. All right, so let's get back to um, this one will probably be where we are, premenopausal. Okay, um, let's, I'm going to see if I can show these um, side by side. So I opened a couple different windows for you and different things. Sometimes it helps just to like see the hormone cycle right, um, right next to it. So you can sort of see the different phases. And if you don't have it memorized in your head, it helps to see it. Or some like to see it in a um, graphical representation. So whatever works for you, or if you have it memorized, then great. All right, I'm gonna walk you through a test now. Let's do this test. So the guide's on the left. And hopefully you'll be able to see both okay. And the Dutch test is on the right. So thumbs up if you can see both. Um, I got rid of all patient data, so you won't be able to see that. Um, let me just move this over here. Okay, good, thank you. Um, all right, so they can, it's not that expensive of a test. You can, if you're not a provider, you can sign up with Dutch. Your, most of your patients can actually get the Dutch test themselves online very inexpensively. So I do have one example of that, or you can offer it through your um, clinic and so if you want to do it through your clinic, just sign up as a provider, easy enough. Um, and this first page is sort of a summary page. 
Um, you'll see the actual collection times. This is a urine metabolite test. And then you'll see the age. So this is a 40 and the gender. This is a 46 year old female patient because there are um, different values depending um, on age. Um, so this summary, you can see this dial here, almost like a gas gauge um, is sort of their pictorial view, which I think is much easier for patients to understand. Oh, we've got more people joining us. Um, and um, so from the star to star is, is essentially the normal range, right? Um, but you can have a high and low normal. In fact, we'll talk about progesterone because you'll see when we go through the treatment booklet, if progesterone in a cycling female is below 12, sometimes, um, it's, it's worthwhile to supplement um, or do something to produce, um, boost progesterone. You'd still be in that dial range, but it may be too low and you have to look at it compared to the other hormones. We're gonna look at all the estrogens. So this is just estradiol right here, um, but we have progesterone. Now these are urine metabolites and you cannot actually um, you know, measure progesterone directly in urine, but you has downstream metabolites. So the lab has been able to figure it out and equate it and calculate it to blood values. Um, and then testosterone. Um, the test typically is done in the luteal phase between days 19 and 21 or 22. So just remember where um, women are gonna be in this phase. So what we expect progesterone to be and where we expect estrogen to be. Um, if, you know, if they're, if they're in menopause, then you can just take the test at any time. And if there's issues where, um, they can't track their cycle, then there's some specific guidelines you can follow, or sometimes you just have to guess if it's really that difficult, but it can throw off the test, um, because it is based on a luteal phase. Um, also, you see this graph here for the daily free cortisol pattern. Now, when we get into it deeper, we're going to look at cortisol and cortisone, which can be helpful. Um, and there's actually a very small percentage in our body that's the actual free unbound uh, cortisone, and cortisone and cortisol. So it's helpful to see the metabolized um, cortisol to get an idea of overall production. You can see these patients very high, still within normal, but high production. And then total DHEA uh, production. So you see that here, and it's a numerical calculated value. They're actually testing DHEAS, you know, with the sulfate, um, and then the downstream antrog antrogens. And it's also, um, you know, there's an age range for what we expect normal uh, production to be. So that's basically their little snapshot on page one. And then we'll get into reading this report and how to use the Dutch guide so you can do it yourself. Um, the second page is just the exact numbers. I, I never really talk to patients about this page. I use the pictorial view because they just look at it and squint and doesn't really mean much to them. Um, so we move on and just go over pay, page two. Now I'd like to zoom, well, let me zoom out for a second, just so you can see the whole page and then I'll just zoom back in. But this is what the whole page looks like. So on this like top left, you have your androgens. Um, on the top right, you have progesterone. And then at the bottom, you know, middle, bottom right and bottom portion here, you have your estrogens and your metabolizing. Um, you can sort of think of this as like phase one and then dipping into phase two um, metabolism of estrogen here. Okay, so let's zoom back in so it makes a little sense. And you can remember like precursors, right? Like cholesterol, LDL. Uh, here we've got pregnenolone. We're making progesterone on the right. This dial wheel is empty because again, it's not a direct measurement for progesterone. So that numerical value on the first page is calculated based on these downstream metabolites that you actually can test in urine. Um, and same with the, the DHEA. And what was this patient again? Let me remember. Um, 
The progesterone was 18.3, that's sufficient. And the DHEA is high normal. Okay, so um, progesterone, the alpha pregnenodial is a little elevated, um, high normal, but otherwise um, not, uh, not deficient for sure. Below, low normal would be closer to the yellow star. Um, below normal would be below the yellow star. Again, you can get the exact values on the previous pages and the range they use. And then the purple is the menopausal range. So this patient um, was 46 at the time this test was taken. She was not yet uh, in menopause. Um, okay, the testosterones here, the androgens, you can see the DHEA sulfate, uh, DHEA. This can be helpful, by the way, too, if you do supplement with DHEA. Um, I do sometimes, I don't do it too often. I try to um, do something even more um, natural lifestyle changes if possible. Otherwise, I'll show you typical DHEA ranges here if you're going to supplement. Um, you can see testosterone. We know testosterone can um, use the enzyme aromatase to form estrogen. So that's what you're seeing here. And then the downstream, the idiocolonolone um, and, and uh, oops, there's someone else in, hang on. Uh, and endosterone um, metabolites here. A little trick to notice, by the way, a possible sign of inflammation is sort of relative on this dial if DHEA, uh, if these downstream metabolites are significantly higher than DHEA, the DHEAS, the one with the sulfate, can uh, be a sign of inflammation. Um, anyway, testosterone is not elevated in her. It looks fine. She does have a preference though, if you look at this fan gauge. So this is 5-alpha reductase activity, and she has a preference a 5-alpha preference, which is going to be a stronger form. It's going to go to DHT, right? Um, so that's going to be a, a more uh, androgenic version. So in, if she came in like really complaining of low, um, you know, testosterone symptoms, I would be cautious in some type of supplement or bioidentical hormone replacement that would boost it because whatever she has is going to go down a stronger pathway. She did not have those symptoms. So the truth is I would just, in this case, it looks fine, normal enough. I would leave it alone and not mess with it. Um, and then you can get age uh, dependent ranges. So for her, she was 46. So DHEA uh, 30 to 350, that's a wide range. Um, and she's actually above normal for her age. You don't have to do anything for someone. Sorry, still admitting people. You don't have to do anything for someone where it's above normal unless um, they're complaining of other like elevated um, testosterone or estrogen symptoms and you think like maybe they're getting some exogenous DHEA of some sort. Um, and so you have to look into that deeper. But otherwise, if someone typically is producing more than their age range, um, usually they're feeling better. <laughs> it's actually not a bad thing. Um, and then her testosterone was 4.2. Um, She's right within range for her age, so fine. Um, so E1 and E2, you know, E2 is the estrogen we're using the vast majority of the time. That's the bulk of the one we're producing at our ovaries. Um, and then we rely more on E1 uh, postmenopause and our adrenal production. E2 is typically boosted during um, pregnancy, right? And um, produced by the placenta. But depending on how these estrogens are metabolized, you can also, you can see the arrows, you can produce it one estrogen can produce off the other, or even this, it can go down this metabolism pathway. So let's just look briefly at the uh, metabolism here. So the preferred pathway, um, the protective pathway is the, um, the two hydroxy pathway. And you can remember those of you, if you were with me and you just had to take the 
IFMCP medical boards, that was one of the questions, right, was um, the hydroxy versus the methoxy um, E1. This is considered um, the better, um, safer um, way to metabolize and convert estrogen. So we're going to actually measure that. Um, but this pathway as a whole, this is represented by the green part of this pie chart here. So you can see expected range is 60 to 80%. And then this specific patient's value is 76%. So she's, she's basically going down the protective pathway. Um, so that's a good thing. And it's, um, it's low normal, looks fine. The red, the 4-hydroxy, that's the one that we consider to be um, the most problematic, um, the most, oh, more to admit, the most carcinogenic. Um, so the, that when, it, when the estrogen is metabolized on that pathway, it binds very tightly with the estrogen receptors. So um, that's a pathway we're trying to avoid. Um, and then the 16 OH, the 16 hydroxy is actually mostly made in the liver. Um, and it's associated with proliferation. So that's not great either. If it's too high, um, you want to focus on typically detoxification. And again, we can start, um, forming other estrogens. Um, it can get a little confusing because the, the term um, 16-OH-E2, you might see that in research, and it, they're not talking about this metabolic pathway. It's actually an equivalent name uh, for estriol. So if you really get into this and read research, sometimes that's a little bit confusing. Um, anyway, you want it between about 13 to 30%. She's at 12.4, it's fine. Um, so she's in range for these metab uh, metabolite pathways. Uh, metabolic pathways, nothing looks um, problematic there. Um, if they go down, the, the reason you see this 4-OH pathway, this 4-hydroxy pathway in red, um, one of the issues is it can, um, it being carcinogenic, is it can form these um, adducts and uh, create oxidative stress. It, and it becomes a phase one uh, uh, metabolism problem, but you can use uh, antioxidants and NAC or sulforaphane, um, these types of things to help with it. Um, if you're going to, if you're going to supplement, by the way, with NAC versus glutathione, this test won't tell you which one's better, but depending on what other tests you have, like a patient I just saw the other day, we were going over a Dutch but we also had a methylation panel. It was Genova's, their one carbon metabolism. And um, so she, her estrogens were too high. We needed to work on clearing them. Um, and she was also low, um, she was low in glutathione. She was sufficient in cysteine. So a lot of times I'm supplementing with NAC and acetylcysteine, but she actually, the precursors, um, her glycine was fine, cysteine was fine, but she was still low in glutathione. So that was an example where I used a reduced um, a liposomal glutathione instead of NAC. So it's fun actually when you start combining a couple of these tests. Okay, so down this pathway, this is a, this, this methylation activity, this fan here, this doesn't equate to like, I was just talking about the methylation panel by Genova. I'm sure there's other ones out there. That's just the one I use. I like it because um, it has all these blood biomarkers and then we um, do a buccal swab and get the genomics. We get 10 um, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, measured, including COMT. So I like seeing that picture together. Um, so this, this does not speak to all of methylation activity, nor does this tell you if they have a COMT SNP, but it can give you a clue if they do. So here um, we have the 2-hydroxy and it needs to methylate to form the 2-methoxy E1. And this fan gauge is basically dividing um, this number by this. 
and you can see she has what it's to the left. So she has low methylation activity. So being able to support that um, would be a good thing, but it's a, it's a piece of it, not the whole methylation activity, right? Um, if she was able to clear a lot, then it would be a high fan and you don't necessarily need to do anything if this fan gauge is over to the right and it's high, it's only when it's low that you're typically doing something. Um, okay, so let's talk, before I keep going through the rest of the tests, let's relate it to the treatment guide, okay? So um, let's see, I mean, she's not terribly out of whack here. So I feel like I should grab another test for you or someone's more messed up, but let's say, um, let's say her estrogen um, was high, like a six, and her, um, so let me try to remember what I'm saying. I'm going to say her estrogen is a six, and her progesterone, let's say it was a 1.5. So how you look at it, the easiest way, I mean, read all the pages, but the easiest way is to hop over here on this grid, okay? So I just said we're going to do an example of uh, elevated estradiol higher than six. So we're in this column on the right-hand side. Um, and then on the left-hand side, um, you match it up to the progesterone. So the first three rows are progesterone, four columns are estrogen. So, so in this example I'm giving with a six, and I literally just saw someone like this, um, this side and progesterone low, so it's gonna be right in this box. So the first thing they're gonna tell you, and you can see the little key down here, so you don't have to remember this, um, confirm that there's no EDCs, they're talking about endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals. So if you do that with your patients, certainly some of the biggest culprits, um, actually even interfering with like phase one uh, detoxification in general, um, xenoestrogens, um, you know, certain chemicals, BPA, that's probably the biggest one, BPA from plastics, uh, they're on all our receipts, things like that. Um, Low iron can be a problem. Smoking, of course. Um, what else? Uh, what you cook with, you know, some um, um, off-gassing chemicals and or cooking too high. Um, barbecuing. I love barbecue, but um, all right. Aromatization. So that's one of the things you want to look at. This person's fine, but if she was a six, is it because her testosterone so? Um, high that it's just going down this pathway of aromatase and making excess est estrogen, or maybe she was um, high in DHEA. She's high in normal and it wasn't a complaint, so it's not an issue, but sometimes someone might come to you and they're already on a supplement or taking some other hormone and you can see the impact of it. Um, all right, so in this case, to bring it back in balance, I gave an example of high estrogen and low progesterone, which is really problematic when you think about the day we're at, right? So it would be like if these little hills in our graph were reversed, the progesterone's much lower and the estrogen's higher, right? Um, so if that were the case, you could start here. They're suggesting using chase tree, vitamin B6, make sure you're supporting phase one and phase two, um, calcium deglucurate, fiber, and then consider PG for progesterone, HRT for hormone replacement therapy. So that's how you read it. And then to break it down a little bit more, Chase Tree, also Vitex. Um, if you, I'm gonna actually show you a supplement I like that has a blend of these, has vitamin B6, has Chase Tree in it, um, has DIM. Uh, so DIM is helpful for, um, being able to convert and clear. Calcium deglucurate. Calcium deglucurate, part of why it's great if you do stool testing. Uh, let's see, I have, a, I have an example I can show you. This is a GI map. I just grabbed their sample test and beta glucuronidase is one of the markers on it. We use this test all the time. So beta glucuronidase is an enzyme actually produced by um, some of the bacteria, so some of the overgrowths that were on this report is why this is getting elevated. And 
if you read the white paper for that lab and start studying that marker, part of what um, you'll see is unfavorable changes in the metabolic environment in the colon. Helpful to know that and sort of piece it all together. But the other thing it does is it interferes um, with estrogen clearance in the liver. So, um, you know, we've got phase one detoxification and we've got phase two detoxification and that's where uh, glucuronidation occurs. And this beta glucuronidase can undo that and unravel it. So um, think of it as the estrogen was all bound up and ready to be excreted. And this enzyme uh, just unraveled that. Because um, of course, as women, we need to produce estrogen, metabolize estrogen, and then clear estrogen. And any um, dysfunction in that process is gonna make us feel pretty crummy. Um, so calcium deglucarate is usually um, what you grab if you see beta glucuronidase elevated. Um, it will interfere with that enzyme's function. Of course, get to the root cause, the bacteria overgrowth that's causing it to begin with. Um, and it's, it's something that's used a lot in estrogen dominance. Estrogen dominance is just a term for when these hormones here are out of balance and the estrogen is quite high relative to progesterone. Uh, there may also be low testosterone. And what does that feel like? Most women will say that it feels like having PMS all month long. They might get more acne, um, they might feel very moody, and they might feel like they're retaining water. In, remember in this guide, when we first started looking at it a couple pages before, it gave you all of the high estrogen um, symptoms. So you can just go back and peek at that. Um, I just wanted to finish describing how to use this. Okay, fiber, of course we know high fiber diet is excellent for helping um, not only keep blood sugar in balance right, uh, supporting and feeding the gut, the microbiome, but also um, estrogen clearance. And then in this example where progesterone was so low and estrogen was high, the first thing you wanna do is ask the patient, did you actually do the test right? Did you take it at the right time? But if they did, then um, sometimes you might wanna do hormone replacement for progesterone because if that's too low, of course, it's gonna be a problem, especially if we have a um, premenopausal woman trying to get pregnant, um, we need progesterone to stay high, right? Uh, to be able to carry the pregnancy and even to support ovulation to get pregnant. So, um, the natural one is chase tree will support, it, it won't make progesterone, but it will support the natural, the body's natural production of progesterone. You could do a supplemental version of a bioidentical hormone replacement. I'll show you two examples. Let me first show you real quick. Um, uh, I like Designs for Health. I've used many, many brands, so I don't work for them either, just showing you. Uh, here's one blend I like. There's called FemGuard. Um, I'll show you. Thank you for asking. Um, Fe uh, FemGuard Plus Balance. So I use this a fair amount of the time. I like the blend of vitamins and minerals here. I've got my calcium deglucurate. Here's some chase tree. Uh, we've got some dim in here. Uh, resveratrol broccoli seed extract uh, is excellent. Um, if you've seen some of the research, like the I3C, the indol, I never remember what that's called. I always use the abbreviation. What is it? Um, indol something three, whatever the heck it is. Um, uh, I see three, indol three carbonyl. Uh, indole 3 carbonyl. I don't use it that much. You, you can use it. It works well. Um, someone has to have good stomach acid for it to work. So if you're going to do it, you might need to give them a digestive aid, which most of my patients need a digestive aid. But I get such a huge concentration of patients with completely messed up guts. It's just not what I would reach for. Um, I would definitely pick DIM over that instead. Um, but also... Um, the amount of dim that you need versus what broccoli seed extract can do in the body is sort of remarkable. So I like it that it's all in here, but if I was gonna isolate it out, 
I would definitely, I have a broccoli seed extract product that I like. Uh, my favorite Vitex Dim, well, this has both of it, um, but I do like Dim Avail, um, which is, I've used many different ones, but I typically use the Designs for Health one. Um, do I use Chase Tree throughout the cycle of low progesterone or after ovulation? Um, typically, like days 12 to 28. Um, so unless there's, unless they're really so terribly low, we have to build it up. Otherwise, typically just during the luteal phase. Um, and then we've had some patients where they just weren't even getting their cycle. Um, and we had to just use the calendar and sort of mimic it and, and retrain their body. Um, what devices do patients use to monitor their ovulation? Um, in my practice, some calculate it, some are using like the natural fertility method where um, they're checking for um, the consistency of the discharge um, and they're taking their temperature, right? So you can use temperature. I think I showed this on one of the graphs. So you can see the body's temperature change right at ovulation. Um, and then some like to use like the pea sticks, right? And you can see if you're ovulating there. Um, a good book to recommend for patients is, God, what is that called? Like how to control your fertility or natural fertility. Um, let's see what that is. Um, will it pop up? Oh, I can't remember it. I'll try to list it afterwards or if someone knows it, pop it in there. So there's only like one real great book that's sort of the Bible for that for patients. So I'm sure someone knows what I'm talking about there. Uh, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. Taking charge of your fertility. That's it. Um, that's a great book to give patients to use so they can actually start learning about their own body's rhythm and um, how it works and start tracking and can be very empowering. Um, all right. If you're going to do a bioidentical, um, those of you that prescribe, you've got some options, right? Oh, we have more people coming in. You can do, um, you know, depending on which hormone you're doing, you've got patches, you've got pellets, you've got creams, you have suppositories, um, shots, you've got um, um, oral. Uh, I don't like progestins. So I'm trying to avoid, I'm trying to avoid synthetic estrogen um, for my patients and synthetic progesterone or progestin. So those seem to be the most problematic from the research that I've read. Um, bioidentical estrogen, I'm not too worried about it. I still don't, ideally, I don't want it unopposed. So everyone has their own opinion, but most of the colleagues I work with um, they don't want to give estrogen unopposed either. They want an estrogen progesterone blend um, and bioidentical progesterone. I'm not really worried about um, by itself or with estrogen. So come to your own decision on that. But that's been my experience. If you're going to do supplemental, um, I like this one by Designs for Health, Progestivale. Um, one dropper full is about 20 milligrams. So I'll show you doses here on that treatment guide in a minute. Um, another option, did I open it? Yeah, um, Bezwecken, if you know that. I still like, to me it's weird that patients could just buy this online by themselves. That seems like really dabbling. I think they need to work with a professional for dosage. I'm very, very conservative in my dosage, um, but this is still supplemental version. So you can actually get, like this is one of their strongest ones here. You can get pretty decent doses, but the nice thing is, is it's, it's almost like microdosing it and you can get it quite, uh, quite low. So um, awful names, but here's their Phyto BL 4X. Um, they have to shake it very well. Um, I usually have them open and close the dropper and um, remind them that it's it's only one third full by design. It's so they have room to like shake the heck out of it. And um, 10 drops is about 40 milligrams of progesterone, um, 1.6 milligrams of estriol and 0.4 of estradiol. So you can work your doses there. And again, I'll show you the amounts in a minute. So you can get pretty high. It's good quality stuff, it works. 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about this, but then again, you have those of you that prescribe have a whole range of um, pharmaceuticals to use or not use. And while bioidenticals are still hormone replacement therapy, there's really quite a difference um, for how it's metabolized and perceived by the body versus the um, synthetics. Um, and in my experience, I don't know what yours is with your patients, but in my experience, uh, when I'm working with hormones, they can change so quickly, like just a little bit can create a massive shift and everything is so connected. I'm very intentional, which is why I like this test. I'm very intentional about where I'm going to start nudging things to change. And then of course, I'm always looking at um, diet and lifestyle is absolutely essential. Um, liver support, um, you know, making sure your liver is completely functional. Um, is essential and, um, you know, exercise, movement, stress management, right, cortisol, and then the, um, the gut microbiome is huge. That could be like a class all by itself. Um, one thing I was going to say for those of you that are new and diving into um, recommending hormone replacement therapy is keep in mind, like if you give DHEA, there's a possibility that you're going to go downstream and uh, increase testosterone or estrogen. So if DHEA was low and these were high, that might not make sense. It, you just have to consider every pathway that you're going to impact. Same with testosterone. Like this was the controversy about a lot of men. At first, all the men just wanted testosterone shots, right? Or um, it just sounded great. But then if it gets too high, it's going to, you know, aromatase to estrogen, then they're going to be unhappy. They're going to end up with more of why they came in to begin with, right? Uh, low libido. And I remember I was thinking of one man in particular that came in, he was an executive and he found himself starting to tear up in board meetings, which was not working for him. Um, anyway, we tested um, and testosterone was elevated and um, going downstream to form estrogen. So we just had to bring things in balance. And let's see, what else was I gonna say about this? Um, oh, I know, estrogen. So if you are giving a supplemental or a prescriptive uh, estrogen hormone replacement therapy, being mindful of these pathways, that's like part of the, the benefit of being able to use this test, um, but also being mindful of um, their methylation activity and if they have a COMT SNP. So that can just make everything so much more uh, complex. And even someone who is low in estrogen, um, I've seen this, um, you know, someone who's low in estrogen and they're taking some hormone replacement therapy, they might feel like a superwoman the first couple of days, but then if they can't metabolize it or clear it, it very quickly can swing to an estrogen dominant um, type of symptomatology. So um, this one I was thinking of in particular, she had very low methylation activity. Like it was just, uh, her gauge was all the way to the far left. And because of that and her response, I ended up testing and sure enough, she had a COMT SNP also. So we completely changed what we were doing based on that. Okay, let's get back to that grid here. So this is where, um, yes, so a question, and then I'll talk more about using the grid. Uh, five, so five alpha reductase activity in women with PCOS. So what I do is, um, it depends on if it's just really high and going down this pathway or not. So I'm always sort of backing up and seeing what's going on. If there's something exogenous that's in there, I'm trying to find out. If there have uh, endocrine disruptors, I'm trying to look at it. Um, I will use like saw palmetto <laughs> um, and, and women. And I have to tell them like why I'm giving them the supplement that says prostate on it. But that's why I'm doing it. I've seen that work quite well. Um, but anyone with PCOS, a, a big issue is um, blood sugar, blood sugar balancing um, and liver health. And then let me just show you, on the, I'm going to come back to this page, but there's a whole section here 
um, for testosterone in women. So um, let's say it's high testosterone and she has high symptoms. Um, and then this 5A reductase is um, favored. So you're on, you can't see my hand here, but hopefully you can see the mouse. So you're in the green column on the right and then the second row from the left across. So investigate potential insulin dysregulation, blood, blood sugar balancing, consider blocking 5A reductase, okay, um, and consider possible PCOS, yes, we will, um, and it can be exacerbated via um, ovarian insulin or adrenal uh, dysfunction, so to look at all of those. And then you'll see here, um, let's see, where did they, I want to, I know where it is, but I want to see where the number was. Um, where's number six along here? I just usually jump to it. Hmm. I don't see it. Maybe it'll jump out at me later. Um, but number seven, if there's high, um, high testosterone, use some herbal anti-antrogen support. So you may already have your favor, but just so you know, like here's a list right here. Spearmint tea, chase tree, vitex, um, licorice, white peony, green tea, black cohosh, red reishi mushroom, right? So three of those ingredients right there were in that supplement blend um, I just talked about. Um, let's see. I was trying to see another one. Um, Okay, how about low testosterone? Um, you could just jump to testosterone replacement therapy um, or you could do some natural things. So three is talking about uh, testosterone replacement therapy, pellets or um, transdermal vaginal creams. You can always use DHEA, right? The precursor, that's usually what I try to do in that example. Um, or I will use, uh, I don't think they list it here. I will use tribulus. Um, well, let's see, I don't know if they say it. Um, five, uh, item number five, the little notes to block 5A reductase, there's Sol Palmetto, I already mentioned that, that's the one I reach for the most often, but also niddle, uh, nettles, I don't know what this one is, um, zinc, green tea extract, the catechins, and reishi uh, mushroom. So um, if you're going to do DHEA, it gives you a dose, but I'm going to show you where other doses are. So that's how you read this. So it looks, you know, odd when you first see it, but it's a very helpful um, resource to have. Okay, let me get back to that. Um, and there's the symptoms again. There's testosterone symptoms. Um, here's the dosing. So hopefully you can see this, whatever category you're in. If you're doing oral progesterone, here's the typical one. Um, I'm usually... I'm usually using this low um, dose, but I will use a, um, a topical. Um, DHEA, I'm, I'm typically in low here, but some, sometimes I'm doing high actually. So it just depends on what their numbers are. Um, I don't use testosterone cream or gel, some people do. It's sort of like a popular thing to do with women now, but too often I'm getting them on the other side where they had pellets and everything went wrong. So I'm not really using that. Um, for dryness, honestly, uh, some natural stuff or some, or some very low dose bioidenticals and, you know, coconut oil can work wonders. Um, if I was going to use like a suppository, I would use one of the um, Beswick and low dose. Um, I do have some patients who are on a prescriptive suppository and we try to get it only one or two times a week um, with their OBGYN. Um, some are using the patch. So for those of you who are using that, here's the dose and you can monitor it with Dutch. And like I said, there are training videos specifically like how to um, use the Dutch to monitor um, an estrogen, estradiol patch for your patient. Um, oh, someone's saying, I had a patient who uses estradiol cream for vaginal dryness. Her estradiol was through the roof. Yeah, there's going to potentially be other consequences for that. So getting the dose right is essential. My goal is always to try to not use medication. It doesn't always work. 
Uh, sometimes you need both, but as low as possible. Um, here's the range for postmenopausal, um, but back here, I just wanted to show you a few more um, examples. You can see some uh, footnote number two here. Yeah, you. I emailed everyone a copy of the guide, so you can just give me your email and I'll send it to you directly, or you can also get it online or through the um, portal. So if you, if you didn't get it from me, you should have. Let me just put, um, here's the email info at doczachary.com. You can email me there and I'll send it to you. Um, or you can find me at my clinic. Um, my clinic name is Body Love Cafe. So either one. Because I know some people, maybe the file was too big and I have to make it smaller for you. So some people didn't go through. Um, okay, so here's some um, um, estrogen support, right? Phytoestrogens, three. So plant-based estrogens to boost estrogen. So if estrogen's low, that's footnote number three. Um, four is just talking about endocrine disrupting chemicals. What was I going to show? Oh, aromatase, aromatase inhibitors on footnote number two. Um, here's some methylation support on five. I'm not talking a lot about that because that's more the when I teach the methylation panel. Um, the one I use most often, I mean, probably vitamin uh, B6 is the one I use most often, but when I'm going more direct, I use SAMe a lot, um, depending on if I think they, like they're not methylating estrogen very well, but maybe I'm worried they're too anxious or have some signs of overmethylation, or I'm looking at their actual uh, methylation panel, I may do TMG instead. Um, I'm always using methylfolate, so that's sort of a given. That's part of why I, I like um, Designs for Health. All their folic acid is actually the 5-MTHF. Um, okay, so Hopefully, oh, let me show you this one more thing before we move on from here. Um, let's say they're, uh, you know, within range, but you're thinking they have poor phase one metabolism. Again, using that DIM or I3C, I reach for DIM um, more often. Um, if there's poor methylation, I'm waiting for the test to show up. If there's poor methylation, um, then you may want to consider some genetic testing. Um, do I check Dutch must uh, much in guys? Uh, oh, very few times, um, like I'm thinking of one, like a young man in his 20s who um, could not sustain an erection. Uh, and that gentleman I was talking about who uh, was in his 40s and tearing up in board meetings. Otherwise, most of the time, I don't treat a ton of guys. Uh, and the ones I do treat, that's probably not entirely fair. The men, most of the men I treat have heart issues and gut digestive issues. So I treat very few men for hormone issues. And most of the time we're able to get a handle on it without even doing the testing. So then that saves them money. Um, but if not, then yes, I would do the testing. All right, let's go to, there's so much more we could say about estrogen here, but I need to finish getting through the rest of the report with you and then we can talk about more questions. Um, okay, so just, just to sort of summarize, like you've got your androgen side, you've got your little progesterone corner, you've got your estrogens, how they metabolize, uh, phase one, and then dipping into phase two uh, methylation here um, and converting from the hydroxies to the methoxy. Okay, so the next page of the Dutch are your um, adrenal markers here. We're starting to look at uh, cortisol. Same thing, I don't stay here for patients because it sort of looks like nothing to them. I could explain all these markers in detail, but I wanna wrap up in the next few minutes for you. So if you have questions and we'd spend a lot of time talking about all these. Um, so let's go to this one, which is the picture view. I, uh, and that's how I describe it to patients too. I jump ahead to this. So this is what the page looks like as a whole. Um, and then I'm just gonna zoom in so you can see it better. And then on this guide, remember when I first walked you through it, on the actual test, 
adrenals come later. On their treatment guide, adrenals are in the beginning. So this is the page, um, page seven, that is helpful. There, there's a couple pages, like here's the symptoms on page six. Um, and then you have that like sort of spectrum. But anyway, this is the, the main page to look at um, that's going to sort of tie it, you, you know, give you the clinical reference um, and be most helpful. Okay. Um, all right. So one thing that's nice to point out to patients is, you know, hypothalamus, pituitary, maybe talk about those glands a little bit. And, um, you know, right here to adrenals, you've got the, you know, cartoon graphic for the HPA access, um, but to talk about how this, um, these glands signal, you know, um, hypothalamus pituitary to thyroid, um, to, the, to the gonads, the sex um, organs, and just how important that relationship is. So sometimes that may be a good conversation. Um, you have a melatonin marker, this person's low normal. So it depends on if they're having sleep issues, if I would do anything about it. Because of some of what we've been talking about, melatonin being immune modulating, those with sleep issues, I am more likely to give three milligrams of melatonin a night this fall and this winter than I was last year. Um, here you've got on the right-hand side, your total DHEA production. And again, the values by age, she's fine. Um, if it was really high, and especially if she had some wacky symptoms, then I'd be trying to find out you know, was she maybe taking it and not telling me? Because DHEA is like, you know, in GNC and these other places like at the cash register and they market it as, um, you know, take, take this supplement and it's anti-aging or you're going to feel so much better. And they might briefly, but just like anything supplement or hormonal that we take, there's always... Um, an impact, you know, is it going to downregulate the gland that's producing it or impact receptor sites or throw off another part of the hormone cascade? So um, I might be asking those questions. All right, her cortisol's high. She was stressed out, mama. Um, so overall, her cortisol's high. This fan gauge, so part of why the lab does this is these two graphs at the bottom, we'll talk about why cortisone and why cortisol. It's such a small percentage of the circulating cortisol, but it's nice to sort of um, see what's going on for them during their 24 hour cycle and, and how it's impacting their life. So it's also this cartoon graphic is helpful for communicating with patients in a way they understand. But metabolized cortisol is a better um, marker. And really these metabolites, the THEA and THEF, there's so much more of it in, um, you know, in circulation and certainly in these uh, urine metabolites that that gives you a more accurate picture. So you want to look at these against each other and usually they will match, but not always. So it gives you a more accurate picture of what's really going on. So for this patient, um, you know, metabolized cortisol, which is a calculated value of both of these is quite high, but this patient prefers, using the fan gauge, prefers cortisone, which is the storage or the inactive version of um, cortisol. And there could be a number of reasons for that. It could be that um, she's just so, has so much, or she's just so stressed and producing so much cortisol. Um, that there's an overabundance of it and it's driving this um, storage form. Um, for someone who had too little, like, um, like this metabolized cortisol was low, but they preferred this cortisone inactive pathway, and then they come to you saying they're really tired and they feel fatigued and crummy, then you might want to use something like a glycerized um, licorice, which uh, will block the enzyme that converts cortisol to cortisol, cortisone, so the active to inactive. So without giving something that will make them feel more stressed or produce um, more cortisol, um, you can just block that conversion and it just allows the cortisol they have to be more available. Um, now, I don't wanna give it to this person because look down here, right? So if you look down here, um, her values are just much higher than you need. And the way you want to read it, by the way, 
the label is a little confusing. So waking A is actually um, represents the overnight value. Um, and cortisol, we know, you can just see by the gray here, but it's supposed to be the highest and spike in the morning, right? It's your like get up and go. And then it drops off throughout the day and we want it the lowest at night. We want melatonin the highest at night and cortisol the lowest at night to, um, to prepare for sleep. And then some people, it, for her overnight, it was actually fine. But if it had been high overnight, I would be asking her, are you waking up a lot at night? Um, especially are you waking up like in that 1 to 3 a.m.? Those of you that do Chinese medicine um, or traditional Chinese medicine, you know that's like the liver hour, um, it, which really refers to how is the blood sugar balanced overnight? Um, how How is the liver operating functionally? Is it able to release glycogen on demand and what's demanding it. Once the blood sugar is exhausted, if you will, overnight, the adrenals will release cortisol to signal the liver to release glycogen. If there's any dysfunction in there, uh, the cortisol can be higher at that point and resulting in the patient waking up. So you can sort of see a picture of it. If this waking A value was high, um, and depending on their symptoms and what they're saying, then you might want to put more effort to winding down the cortisol um, in the evening and before bed. You might wanna do something to support blood sugar um, before bed and overnight. You might wanna explore liver uh, health and their ability to detoxify um, in more detail. Uh, you might wanna give adrenal adaptogen support. So a lot of these things are listed here. Okay, so morning B is the true morning range. So that's the one that you want to see um, higher. And then afternoon, this is helpful too. Sometimes you see people with the afternoon dip, right? Starbucks knows like 2, 3 p.m. That's when everyone's crashing. <laughs> um, and so they're going and buying sugary drinks or, or whatever um, to try to compensate for that, which just perpetuates the problem. Um, so she's still quite high for the afternoon um, and then definitely too high at night. So is, she's described as a night person. Um, and some of these people, you can really sort of map it out and see like they, I've had patients where they're low in the morning, they're dragging, they can barely get out of bed in the afternoon, they're still dying and they're like struggling to get dinner together for the kids and whatnot. And then all of a sudden at night, now Facebook knows this, right? At night, 10, 11 PM, they're wide awake. And now all of a sudden she can like clean the house or she's on Facebook with friends or she has all this energy and then she has a really hard time getting to sleep. So a lot more we could say about that, but um, anyway, let me tie it here to the treatment guide for you. So, um, in general, they're giving you some low uh, cortisol or um, high cortisol recommendations. So low, you can see, um, you know, ginseng, rhodiola, schizandra, licorice, maca, you're probably familiar with most of these. Adrenal glandulars, some of you use adrenal glandulars. Um, circadian training, right, sleep therapy. Um, Steroid medication is really only used um, typically like someone has Addison's or something. But um, for those of you that are endocrinologists, you you know when to use that and when to do it. Those of you that are working with um, people with these types of patterns, it's typically not that extreme. I, I won't say we haven't ever found it because we have, but it really jumps out at you. Like um, uh, just... The, the hormones are just gone. There's nothing, they're not producing anything. And then we have to start uh, checking um, or it's so far through the roof. We think it's Cushing's, right? Um, all right, high cortisol, lifestyle, inflammation, stress, infection, of course can play a role. Uh, meditation, prayer, calming support. GABA is great. In fact, I probably have GABA within arm's reach. Yeah, <laughs> I love GABA. This is the one I use. There's a bunch of different ones. I like this one because you can chew it and it's very fast acting. Um, all right, um, uh, taurine, great. 5-HTP can be helpful. So 5-HTP will go downstream to make serotonin um, and different than like if you supplement with tryptophan, tryptophan 
could go down to form quinolinic acid. 5-HTP won't do that. Uh, L-theanine, I see that most often in some of my nighttime blends, um, but some use it during the day. Um, a couple um, calming um, herbs here. I use passion flowers called cup of ferma. Phosphatidylserine, probably one of the best ones. We talk about it a lot um, in IFM training. So I, I love phosphatidylserine. It used to be a product, an animal brain product. You don't find that in supplement form anymore for good reason. Um, and so the one I use is, I think, a sunflower uh, based. Uh, so it's a you know lipid, but works really well uh, two to three in the evening um, for calming that cortisol response at night. Okay, and then just general adaptogen um, support right here. So um, I was going to show you a blend. We'll see if you guys want to see it. I'll show you some other blends. Okay, and then um, if DHEA is lower, you might want to consider adding some DHEA in. So they're talking about that. Um, if it's higher, basically every every scenario um, is there, which is which is great. Okay, let's go back to the test. And um, the last page of markers, and then I'll show you what else is on there, and then we're done. We'll take questions. Okay. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> um, all right, the, uh, this is methylmalonic acid, vitamin B12. So if that is high, this patient was fine, but very often I see the patients high, they might be low. Um, I like to use methylcobalamine, so that's what I use. Um, vitamin B6, we have two metabolites that if they're high, uh, they can be deficient. This patient was high in one of them above range um, in the other. I did supplement with vitamin B6 for her. Um, glutathione, this is a marker where high or low, um, they can be out of range. She was the high end of range, but I had some other tests that showed um, that would be helpful supplement for her. Um, we ended up using NAC. And then the neurotransmitters, some people consider it sort of controversial to do neurotransmitters. I've been doing it for so many years that I've been able to really tie it in clinically that I, I think it's valuable information. So there's only two markers on here. There's not much, but if you do organic acid, these are organic acids, but if you do a organic acid test, I tend to use the, um, the one from Great Plains. Um, they have more and I've found them very helpful clinically. Um, but anyway, um, this was within range, but you've got a dopamine marker and norepinephrine, epinephrine. She's above range, not surprising considering her cortisol was so high and her clinical representation was sort of this stressed out patient anyway. Um, her melatonin was lower, makes sense. Her cortisol was so high at night and she's having trouble sleeping. Um, and then for oxidative stress, you'll see this eight um, hydroxy marker more and more now. Obviously, it doesn't tell you everything, but if it's high, it's a good sign to start looking for elsewhere. So um, oxidative damage, right? Um, a potential DNA, you know, cancer precursor marker. Um, the next page, I'm going to zoom out so you can see it. It's, it's sideways, but there you've got the whole pathway. This is very helpful, including you can just, you can just geek out and map out the whole half. Um, pathway, look at where they're messed up. I have to say, after doing this a million times, I already told you guys, so you know, I created a lab software app and it does all this stuff for you. <laughs> I did it just because I was tired of mapping it all out and going through it. So you just actually, my staff can punch in the numbers and it just gives a PDF report. Um, but it is great for learning to map all these things out and see it. And then even some of the um, you know, lifestyle and supplements and uh, remedies are listed right there, whether you're going to upregulate or downregulate. So it is a nice little grid, but I don't go over this with the patient because most of us practitioners, it gives us a headache. There's no way they want to look at that. Um, this comes with every Dutch report and it's really sort of their standard boilerplate information that gives you some definitions. And then in bold will be sort of specific to your patient but it's not necessarily 
um, a lot of information. So if you just jump from one bold section to the next, you get a little bit, but if you rely just on that, you're gonna think, oh, this test doesn't, this just doesn't give you a lot of information. So that's why you wanna use the treatment guide. It's so much, it's so much more helpful. Um, all right, let me just show you another test real quick. And then if there's any questions, we'll take them. I'll make sure there, uh, if there was any other little tidbits I wanted to share with you that are helpful. Um, okay, let's see. This is a 48 year old woman. Um, she's starting to, she's not, she's not in menopause yet, but she's starting to get in perimenopause. Her estrogen's starting to get lower. Her testosterone was low. Progesterone was still decent rate. Her cortisol cycle wasn't bad. Um, her, her pattern here was fine, but this, the, she wasn't going down the right pathway was the main issue here. Yeah, her 16 uh, hydroxy was quite high. 60% was metabolizing down this pathway. And as a result, um, you can see right here, uh, she's producing a lot of estriol. Yeah, you can get this Dutch treatment guide in their, on their website, even I think searching Google. Um, if not, email me, I'll send it to you. But um, yeah, it's, it's there. And that's where, like I said, I don't use, for those of you that came late, I showed, um, if you like Metagenics, I don't use it, but if you like it, they give you their version specific to their supplements. If you use orthomolecular, they have their version too. Um, but using the treatment guide, you can just take the ingredients and use whatever company you like. Okay, so anyway, you can see this, um, this patient is going down this pathway here. I wanted to show you just this young one. Uh, so here was a 14 year old. Her complaint was um, acne and some moodiness and her estrogen was quite elevated. Progesterone was low. Does Designs Health for Health have a treatment guide? They don't, but the lab software I made, I used their supplements plus some others, um, but I can give you the information. Um, and her testosterone was relatively high. So, and then look at her stress. Her stress was just like off the charts. So, so much work to be um, done with this young one. Um, how is she metabolizing? Um, she was going down the protective pathway. That was good. Her methylation um, ability looked fine. She just, her values are too high. So we had to deal with stress for sure. We actually did do some progesterone um, hormone replacement therapy just because it was so out of whack and the symptoms. Um, uh, testosterone, I gave her um, Salpimento. I didn't give her DHEA, even though it wasn't high, because look at look at how high her testosterone is. She's already dealing with acne. Um, her androsterone um, is high, and she has that preference, that five alpha preference. Um, so she's going to make DHT. It's just going to be, you know, more androgenic. So I didn't want to make a really angry young girl. Um, but her progesterone's too low. So that's what we, um, we actually did that earlier. I didn't want to wait and go with um, some of the herbs. We did um, bioidentical progesterone earlier on. Um, and then I had one more example. This is a 35 year old um, I grabbed. And so still childbearing years, still cycling. Look at, she's like in that perimenopausal, almost menopausal phase. Uh, so this was a problem. So. Um, we actually did bioidentical estrogen and progesterone um, together and then dealt with this here. Look at this low, and she had the symptoms of low energy. Um, so I gave her an adrenal adaptogen with licorice that she took um, in the morning. Um, I, um, what did I give her? I can't remember, um, but I was addressing this overnight pattern and we did some uh, liver detoxification. Okay, real quick, let me see if there was anything. Um, 
Oh, one, one other thing I remember I was going to say is you want to make sure that they can clear their estrogen too because it can interfere with their neurotransmitter production. Um, other than that, I think I hit most of the key points for reading the test and using the guide. It's available to everyone. Let me just show you their website real quick. Um, this is their website. Again, I have zero affiliation with them. They don't know me other than I'm one of their practitioners, right? Just one of the many docs out there using them. Um, Dutch is an acronym, Dried Urine Test for Comprehensive Hormones. They have some other tests too, but really that's the only one I use. Yes, myo-inositol many times for PCOS. Absolutely. Good question. Um, I can show you one of the ones I use. I'm gonna, uh, I'll sound, this. I like this one right here with the alpha lipoic acid, Sensitol. I probably sound like a commercial for Designs for Health. Everyone has their favorite brands. I use like 25 different companies, but I use um, Designs for Health the most. I like their products. I think they're clean. They get me results I can count on. And they, um, I think they have an amazing customer service. And when I moved, to seeing people virtually, oh, it's so much better. I honestly don't know why any practitioner wouldn't want to use them. Uh, you can have an e-store, they've got health coaching apps. It's just so great. Okay, here's the Dutch, the lab site. So Precision Analytical Inc. is the name of the actual lab company. Dutch is the name of one of their tests. They have all these tests here. Dutch Complete is the only one I ever do. I looked at the other ones, tried a few. Dutch Complete's my favorite for sure. Um, and then somewhere in here, here's some videos, like an introduction guide. Um, and then when you become a provider, um, you know, it's free to sign up. You just get into the portal, um, order test kits, or get them drop shipped to your patients. Um, oh, I'll show you another little secret tip for how to get labs to patients. That's awesome. Um, anyway, they have tons of education is what I wanted to say and they have this guide in here somewhere. You should be able to find it. Um, someone said her anxiety was worsening on, um, on inositol. Maybe was her blood sugar getting too low then and she's getting hypoglycemic? I don't know, I'd be asking, asking what else was going on there. What detox supplements do I use if E3 is high? Um, so I like uh, sephorophane, um, uh, broccoli sprouts with myrosininase in it. Um, so this is the one that I use. Uh, there it is right there, Brocco Protect. Um, so that's the one I like. Um, and then uh, the other thing I was going to say about that is go back stream. Like why, what's possibly causing this to get high, right? Like where, what else is going on? So I'm always trying to get at the root cause, but otherwise I like this. I think it works so well. Um, and then I use NAC a lot also for sure. Um, when might you use the Dutch cortisol awakening response? Um, so the Dutch... You can get it, you can get that cortisol cycle by itself. Um, the Dutch with cortisol awakening, uh, I've only done that a few times. If I remember correctly, it was just a longer monitoring. So I can't answer that question very well. It's been too long. I can't remember it. Sorry. Um, I just always use that Dutch complete. Um, what else was I going to show you? Oh, I know what I was going to show you. How to order labs, a great way. I love this site. Again, I'm not affiliated with them other than I use them. I think they're great. Um, let me make sure I don't sign in. <laughs> um, but Rupa Health, if you don't know Rupa Health, tell them I sent you. But they're just wonderful. So we do a ton of labs in our office. And my staff used to like always be ordering from all these different portals and then getting the kits and mailing them to patients and then having to check all the portals. So I only have 
like one test right now that doesn't go through Rupa. Otherwise I can order everything through Rupa and you just log in, you have a free account with them. They charge a 7% fee and um, which is nothing, right? Like a $300 lab test, that'd be $20, $21, right? So um, what they will do is you can just place the order. They will mail the test kit to the patient. They will send them instructions. They'll handle customer service. Um, they'll collect the results, let you know when they're in. Your staff can download the report. And then it's great because maybe for one patient, you're ordering labs from five different tests um, and you get to see it all in one portal and they ship it all. And the other thing too, is if you don't wanna collect money from it, have the patients pay direct, you can do that. Um, if you have like a service fee and you wanna charge through your office, you can do that too. So you have both options there. Um, so that can be nice. Uh, so anyway, so that's them, you can read you can read um, about some of their tests that they have available and you know what it's what it's like. I'm trying to click the little tab and it's not jumping, but what it's like for uh, being a patient with it. Okay, if you have any other questions, you can just ask through chat or you can unmute yourself if you want, or you can just go have a Saturday night and, and say good night, whatever works for you. But thank you so much for being here. It's always fun to um, share stories and give little tips. I'm happy to do it again if it's helpful. Um, and hopefully you'll start using this if you want to dive into uh, hormone. Um, what was the number? Uh, what's the best test to run to figure out root cause for PCOS? Um, well, it depends on who you're asking. They'll argue, you know, some will say it's unknown and there's no cause and there's no way to resolve it. Um, in my experience, the, uh, the biggest issue is blood sugar balancing and what is playing a role in that. And then, um, uh, you know, hormones that are out of balance. I use Dutch for that. So, uh, it's usually true PCOS, you're going to see high testosterone and an overproductions of cysts on the ovaries. That's like true PCOS. But you'll see other people who have like subclinical um, symptoms of it. So um, that's my experience. Um, if I use topical progesterone estradiol, do I monitor it with Dutch? I do. And part of that treatment guide um, and those are saying bye, thank you. Um, part of that treatment guide talked about how to monitor it and you can go to um, their Dutch, that Dutch website um, and see videos that will be very, very specific like estrogen creams, testosterone pellets, like uh, of estrogen patch um, and that's helpful. Would you share your favorite GABA? Oh my gosh, my favorite GABA, yes is this one. <laughs> I took nine yesterday. It was a crappy day, um, but it's great. I was really happy by the end of the day. So this is 200 milligrams in two tablets. This is a chewable of Pharma GABA um, and really nothing else. And um, I've used like a liposomal GABA with L-theanine. I didn't like it as much as this one. And then I have some practitioners um, I work with that like a higher um, amount of GABA in a capsule. I'm not as big a fan of that because it's a slower onset. So, um, but yeah, Designs for Health is my favorite pharma GABA. Um, waiting for the lab app. Yes, you and me, it is almost done. For those who are waiting for the software app, um, I built the first version four years ago. We've used it. Um, so long with hundreds, hundreds, maybe even thousands of times. I mean, just so much. It's been great. But this last year, I spent the year, I completely expanded it. There's 130 um, blood markers. And then I added the Dutch test and I added um, stool testing, GI map, but you can use it for other ones too. I added uh, leaky gut, intestinal barrier testing, um, you know, zonulin, histamine, DAO, lipopolysaccharides. I did urinalysis. 
I did the organic acid test. I feel like I'm forgetting one too. Anyway, I did a lot of them. It's just thousands of pieces of data. So we're right at the last bit of proofing it. And then it's great. It's going to be very low cost and your staff just punches it in. And then it says what it is, lifestyle stuff to do, supplements to use. I can't wait myself to. Um, do I give patients a copy of their reports? Yes, absolutely. So we use Jane. Some of you might use Jane software app. Um, so we use the Jane portal. And before when I was just like in a clinic using paper, I would still give them a printout, but now it's so much easier and so much less paper. So I just give them the pretty version of their, um, of their printout here, right? So they've got the nice color version. And then I write some key findings. So we sort of have a template to write key findings. Um, and I'm going over, uh, over that. So when I'm looking at it, it's like, where's that little treatment guide thing go? There it is. Um, I could have it open to this window. I don't need to, because I've already looked at it. I know, I know what's going on. But if I wanted, I, I could have it open to this window, but oops, that's the chat. Let me move that to the side. Um, but basically I just go through the pages. I go through the summary here and I just reflect on sort of the key highlights. I, I skip page two, you know, I just tell them it's the values. And then I go over this page in less detail than I did with you, but just hit the highlights. Same thing, skip this page, just say it's the values, go over this, and then pick up any markers here um, that are relevant. And I'm just explaining it as I go along. I could give a demo sometime if you want, like sort of a report of findings, what I typically do. Um, but they get the clean version so they can share it with their primary care physician, their OBGYN, other practitioners. And then um, they have their notes for me. And then I've been talking to them about what I think they should do. And then my chart notes, I send them my chart notes and it says lifestyle changes, diet, if they need to exercise, uh, if we're doing supplements, if we're doing hormone replacement therapy, whatever it is, it's all in there. Um, and the way I do it is I write it out. So, um, you know, there's no like, oh, do I want to do this? Or do I want to go order that thing? Like they have time to sit and digest it, think about it. They want to order something they can do it themselves or they can ask my office to help them all right any other questions or did we get through them all all right i think we're good bye everyone thank you so much i'm glad you're here